If you have a Bible, turn to Acts chapter 17, and kids can make their way to a children's church if you'd like to do that. If you're new with us, you can go check that out if you want. Their kids are welcome to stay in with us too. We love them up here. Uh, we just think they like it better down there. Uh, it's another holiday season's upon us. How many of you would have put up Christmas decorations like three weeks earlier if somebody would let you? Let me see. Really? How many would not take it down? Like, you just, really? <clears throat> Do you guys all see who those were, right? <laughs> they're, they're those people. Um, <clears throat> well, it is, it's definitely that time of year, and uh, this is our first Christmas happening in, uh, in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> it's a lot like everywhere else. Decorations and all sorts of stuff. As popular as Christmas is, there's... Uh, there are a lot of opinions about different types of things for the, uh, for the holidays. Like, we were uh, recently, this last fall, we spent six months, uh, last winter, six months at a little church in Wilcox, Arizona, uh, down not far from Tombstone, down in the southern part. It was an amazing group of people, but they had a little controversy going on for a while about the Christmas tree, the Jeremiah 10. When I say Jeremiah 10 and Christmas tree, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Oh, I'm proud of you. Okay, a couple of you do. So I'll, I'll even read the text for you. So we had people that were like totally opposed to the Christmas tree because of this, these verses. For the practices of the people are worthless. They cut a tree out of the forest, and a craftsman shapes it with his chisel. They adorn it with silver and gold, and they fasten it with a hammer and nails so it will not totter. How about that? There you go. For all you anti-Christmas decoration people, you've got a passage to say that the tree is a bad idea. Obviously, it has nothing to do with a Christmas tree, has nothing to do with Christmas whatsoever. Literally, the text is about idols and carving wood tree into an idol. But there are people out there standing against the, uh, the Christmas tree. How about that? Or Santa. They're very anti-Santa. Now I'm getting closer to home with some of you. People are against Santa. I'm glad he's fictional or else his feelings would be hurt. Uh, you know what you call a kid who doesn't um, believe in Santa? A rebel without a clause. That's what that is. That would be... Um, so, you know, if you get too sentimental about that whole subject. Um, so, what we're going to do is not stand against something. We're going to stand for something. And that's important. A lot of times we're quick to stand against something. With the end of the day, made no difference whatsoever. Well, except you've successfully maybe alienated some friends. Outside of that, maybe didn't do anything successful. Instead of standing against something, maybe if we were more pro-something, a little bit more for something, so today's kind of a standalone thought, a standalone message. Consider it kind of pre-Christmas, pre-Advent, pre-season. We're looking ahead, and we're just looking at that season ahead of us. We've got, we have four Sundays coming up, which are the four Sundays of Advent, for those of you that grew up recognizing Advent. And then we have Christmas Eve service. Let's stand for something. Let's have singular focus on one particular subject, and that's what we're going to talk about. But I want to pray for us. Father, th thank you for a privilege of standing here in front of these, my friends. And for those new with us, grateful that they're here. Give us wisdom. Help us to grasp <clears throat> the centrality of this truth of your son Jesus and how to keep him so much on our mind and center through the season. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to say something really obvious to start us off, and that is that we talk about things that we're passionate about. Whether you like to or want to or not, I was holding, I was walking out of somewhere, and I was holding the door for this, uh, this older a gal, and she like 
bumped into the wall and she was looking at her phone. And, I'm st- and then she looks, she goes, oh, I'm sorry, like, and then walk through. And then she says, I'm looking at pictures of my grandkids. Do you want to see them? And I went, oh, no. <laughs> no, not interested. She thought that was funny. It wasn't a joke. <clears throat> but it's like you are with your grandkids or something. You're like, you got to see these pictures. All right. We'd love to. Why do we? Because we, we talk about things that we're passionate about. We talk about things that we love. Your favorite sports team. Do you have a favorite sports team? Is there one playing today? Are they playing against Cincinnati by any chance? Okay. They're, they're going to win. That's okay. They're, that's a great team. Steelers are fine, right? Big Pirates fan, anybody? I'm becoming a Pirates fan since I'm realizing nobody else is. <laughs> All right? I'm catching on. I've, I've, from say, from uh, Goodwill, I've gotten three different kinds of Pirates hats because I'm like, that's harmless. They don't hurt anybody. So that could be fun. Most of us have on our phones pictures of some of our favorite things, and, and you know what they are. They would be, like in my case, um, one of my favorite things would be, oh, look at that. It's a 1921 Parker Duofold. Is that exciting? No, look at that thing. Look at that sweet ride. Isn't that gorgeous? Huh, not getting a lot of oohs and ahs. All right, maybe it's not a pen. Look at the next one. Oh, it's another pen. Look at that one. Is that, that's sterling silver right there. That is 1915 Waterman. If you come to my office sometime, I'll let you hold it. Just put a little glove on. That would be fine. We'll get the lighting just right. That right there. I'll, I could talk pens with you all day long. Yes, there's one in my pocket right now. It's an Esterbrook, 1960s Esterbrook. How many of you grew up writing with an Esterbrook pen? Remember the dipped Esterbrook? Really? In school, some of our older folks? Uh, did, did you go to school growing up? Did anyone? I mean, I, I th- we're not in West Virginia. Well, what's going on here? Did you go to school? Oh, sorry, West Virginia back there. I'm su- surprised she understood me. The... Um, uh, oh, really, Lisa? Yeah, boo. Hey, Ron, that was funny, though, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. A little marriage problem going to happen after this. You really didn't write with an Esterbrook pen? Like some of your older folks? Really? Huh. All right. What's that? Not you. You're a young person. Yeah, I don't mean you. A number two pencil. Okay, I've heard of those. Yeah, I've heard of those. Those are really nice. Okay, we had brought into our family, let's get to things that are really important. We had brought into our family about eight years ago, born a beautiful black lab. Her name is Nebraska. That's how we spell her name, Nebraska. Nebraska right there, look at those eyes. That's a great dog. That dog right there that you're looking at is, um, is valued at $50,000. And we had to leave her behind with our son. She was amazing. She would, I don't know, what are some of the fun things? He could walk in a room with, she's a C&I dog, walk into a room and he could say, because he's high school and then college, cafeteria, walk in and say, find the chair and she'll look around for an empty chair and take him to it. Isn't that awesome? But what's really funny is they'd be walking, and I've seen it, they're walking and it's raining, and um, she doesn't like to get her feet wet. So she's supposed to protect Grant, but she'll walk around a puddle and put him right into the depth of a puddle. (laughs) It's the funniest thing in the world to watch because you can see she sees it coming and she's like, Boy, it's me or, me or him. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> That's Nebraska. Oh, man, she's great. You have things that you'll talk about. And you talk a lot about it, 
and you others have to kind of put up with it. I'll sit in my garage in Phoenix, so 115 degrees, I'll sit in my garage in a chair just to stare at my Harley Davidson. And I don't think that's weird. And if it weren't for a sane wife, it would be in the house with us, which many of you right now this season, you're debating, do I bring the bike in the house? Because you can't leave it outside. You can't leave it in a cold garage. There's things that we love. There's things that we want to talk about. And there's a, a, an odd barrier with us being this way about Jesus. Of course he means the world to us. But there's somehow this unusual barrier that, well, they don't want to hear it. So I don't want to talk about it. You don't want to hear it. No, you don't want to hear about fountain pens and it didn't stop me. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll talk all day about Nebraska. She's just the greatest dog in the world. I'll talk about her all day long. And you not caring doesn't mean a thing to me. So it's not that. Well, I won't be received well. I won't be, I, I don't know. It, it doesn't seem to stop us with things that we really care about. Somehow this barrier, there's a passage, if you have your Bible open, it's Acts 17, 16. It's a passage that has meant a lot to me over the years and maybe more so until recently when we were in Athens, just, uh, we were in Athens just last fall. L look at this passage. It's very simple, but I don't want you to miss what's happening. It's Acts 17, 16. Before you read it, Paul is meeting up, big metropolis city, Athens. He's waiting to uh, be with Timothy and Silas. He's waiting for the two of them to join him. So he's there first, he's waiting for them, and then they're going to be about their mission, which is telling this met metropolis of a city about Jesus, okay? Verse 16, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him. He saw that the city was full of idols so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Just slow that passage down. He's waiting for them in Athens. Think about going to New York City. Think about going to a, a big city. There is not a more beautiful view, honestly, of a city as beautiful but not more beautiful than going through that tunnel and then there's Pittsburgh. Am I right? You can't get tired of that, except the traffic to get to the tunnel. The anticipation's longer than it should be. Awesome. So you go to a big city. You've been to some and many, maybe. And you go there, and we're, we're seeing this place. You found a coffee shop, and you're sitting. Watch this. He's actually waiting for his ministry team to join him to do ministry in the big city. But his spirit was provoked. His heart was stirred, if you have the NIV. His heart was stirred. While he's waiting for them in Athens, his heart was stirred because of the idolatry that he saw everywhere. And so off into the synagogue he went to reason with them and share Christ with them. And he's doing it with anyone who's going to listen. It's like, you know what, Paul said, or uh, Timothy Silas, you'll find me. You just, just listen for the chaos. That'll be me. I can't wait for you guys. It's too much in me. I have to say it. I have to talk. I have to tell people. And right off the bat, I want to just, just kind of come clean. That's not me. We literally showed up in Athens. It was funny. We got there like at late morning... And anywhere in town, you can see up at Athens, the beautiful uh, ruins. We made our way out. It was awesome. It was beautiful. Went back to the hotel room. What did we go to sleep at 2 or 3 in the afternoon? 
woke up at 11 o'clock or noon the next day. How did that happen? And I was living for the free breakfast in the morning. I was like, this is awesome. I'm going to go to sleep. We're gonna, I don't know how we'll get through the night. We slept like almost 24 hours. It was unbelievable. And I'll admit it. I was looking at the ruins. I'm looking at Mars Hill where Paul preached. Is right there. You can go there. You can see the, the location. Why am I not the guy who sees not the ruins not the t-shirts, the postcards, the great coffee. Why am I not the guy who sees the idolatry in the city and am more bothered by them not knowing Christ than I am overwhelmed by the, this is an amazing city? It's... I think it's a fair question. We bring up hunting. Honestly, you could talk 30 straight minutes on hunting, and it's interesting. 30 straight minutes on pens, not as interesting, admittedly. Oh, come on. That waterman, do you want me to bring it back up? No? Okay. I only put two up there. I have others. I do have others. All of these interests of ours are interesting. The, the tie is with the passion. So, in fact, it's in the passage. Look, look at the movement. First, his spirit was provoked because he saw the city. Then he reasoned. Spirit moved. He saw the problem, and then he acted on it. So, we're not acting on it. Maybe we could say that. We're not acting on it much as we should. So, back up. Is it that we don't see the problem? Yeah, it could be. I'm looking at other things. Back up one more. Spirit provoked. That's me. I, I wish the problem was the third or the second, the problem is the first. I'm not stirred inside by what I'm looking at. So what do we do? I mean, would we just feel guilty about it? No, it's none of that. I get to start there. Do you remember? We don't just work at something. It's God's grace working through us. So we don't see a need or see a flaw in our life and say, I'm going to fix that. No, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Let's be more grace-filled. So let's back up. And honestly, if it's you, just simply say, as I'm saying about myself, God my spirit's not really stirred about the people who don't know Christ. And he goes, yeah, come here. Let me give you a hug. I know where you are. Well, God, I can just start sharing the gospel. He goes, oh, don't do that. Don't, don't. Don't run the engine without the oil. Just ask God. God, would you put in me more of a recognition of people without Christ? Would you put within me a desire? Would you stir my heart that I want to say it? I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to unless you stir it. And then it's back to the relationship with him and the grace within him to share the gospel. Here's a second point. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second point is, this is great news. The world is responding to Christ. I think we think we're such a minority. So <clears throat> you can find this information very easily, so it's not, this isn't challenging. There's 435 uh, members in the House of Representatives, okay? 435. Nine out of ten are Christian. Okay, I thought we were a minority. Nine out of ten are Christian. The largest group, 
religious group, religious affiliation, the largest in the House of Representatives, is Protestant. Second is Catholic. Okay? 294 are Protestant, uh, Methodist, Presbyterian, Assemblies. Do you know what the largest Protestant group is in the House of Representatives? Significantly, Baptist. 66. Next highest is Methodist at 34. There are more Baptists in the House of... Why are we acting as though we're on a fringe? Non-affiliated? Now, they say atheist. Atheists, but slash non-affiliated. There are some that just wouldn't say. Kind of an Abraham Lincoln thing who wouldn't claim anything. Might be the only president that didn't claim a religious affiliation. Didn't mean he wasn't. He wouldn't claim it. And that is... I think possibly up to 13 of the 435. 13. In China today, there are more people in church in China today on a Sunday than there are all of Europe combined. It's spectacular, the movement. One-third of South Korea are believers. And it's not stagnant, it's not stopping, it's, it's growing. You know the largest group today? <clears throat> the largest group, uh, listen to this, from University of California, Pentecostalism, Protestant Christian group, fastest growing religion in the world. According to Pulitzer Center, 35,000 people become uh, Pentecostal through a born-again experience every day. Well, it's, it's like we feel like we're out there alone sharing the gospel. It wasn't that long ago we were in a team of people down in Trinidad and Tobago, the little island of Tobago specifically, and we're out sharing the gospel all over the island. It was groups. There's like 25 groups of three spread across the island. And we keep track of everything that happens, everything that goes on. 70% positive response to the gospel of Jesus Christ meaning they were either already a believer or they professed Christ having talked to us. Seventy percent. Somehow we have it in our mind that it's slowed down or somehow Christianity is, yeah, it is. It's quite a bit less in America than it used to be. No doubt about that. There's some horrible statistics on what's happening in America with a decline, but you look at the decline, you go, we're still. So why are we so hesitant? I mean, it's amazing how we can turn a conversation into a grandchild or your black lab. It's amazing. We just, hey, how you doing? Yeah, Steelers are on today. Yeah, that's right. Steelers, black and gold. I have a black lab. And you're like, what? What kind of a segue was that? We'll figure out any way to talk about things that we love. We do the same thing with Jesus. It doesn't have to be smooth. It doesn't have to be clever. You're complimented on something at work. Yeah, you humbly accept the compliment. Yeah, you could do that. Or you could say, honestly, the Lord is so good to me. And they go, hmm, yeah, the Lord is just good to me, Jesus. Because I'll tell you, I, I would not be that sharp, have figured that out. The Lord is just kind-hearted. Why not? We do it with everything else. Why wouldn't we do it with Jesus? Third quick point here is the... Um, to speak out has always been the plan, and it's always had risk. There are a lot of different types of evangelism methods today. 
<clears throat> uh, there's street evangelism. There's <clears throat> confrontational evangelism. It's their Bible tracks. You could do, <clears throat> excuse me, you could do anything you want in ways in which to share the gospel. And an interesting one that has become less popular because it's not as culturally acceptable today is what's called confrontational evangelism. That was, that was a, a little phrase coined decades ago, confrontational evangelism. We don't do that because that's not culturally what we do. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be too against that. And Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, known as the first martyr of the Christian church, was out on a street corner preaching Christ, and he was killed for it. So was it more culturally acceptable then? I don't think it's ever been culturally acceptable. There's a guy, I only met him once or twice, talked to him briefly. Uh, Arizona State University, there's a, the main street, is called Mill Avenue. Mill Avenue is where all the action is. Um, Mill Avenue is where the goalposts will end up. If they beat somebody incredible, they rip it out and it goes down Mill Avenue. So we used to take a group of college students on a Saturday night late uh, there's a great coffee place called the Coffee Plantation. So we'd get our coffee, and there was a street preacher. I mean, it was old school. He was tall, he was dressed very common, and he literally carried a box with him. And he would lay the box down on the corner out in front of the coffee plantation, stand on the box, and talk about Jesus. Well, He's, he was known at the time at ASU. He was there all the time, and he always got a crowd, and he always got hecklers, got people being, you know, they get drinking on Mill Avenue, so they're rude to him, and he would do that for like two or three straight hours. And we, I'd have a dozen college students, and we'd all have our coffees, and we'd watch for a while, all saying the same thing. Oof, I couldn't do that. This guy takes abuse. But what we did was we mixed in with the crowd. So I grabbed my coffee, and I would just go and stand next to people and watch him. What's going on? I'd say to a stranger. What is going on? He goes, oh, this guy's here all the time. Isn't he fun? Yeah, he certainly believes in what he's talking about. What do you think? We led college students to Christ just like scraps from what this guy was doing. So one night in particular, 2 a.m., he's crowds mostly gone, or now they can't understand a thing because of the drinking, and he grabs his box, and he had a couple students like with him and I walked alongside of him to his car and I said hey he goes oh hey how you doing and I'm like wow that was a normal response I said I'm good he goes what were you doing out there I said me he goes yeah I saw you what were you doing um there's a group of us he goes no I know who y'all were I saw you I'm just curious what, what's going on. Is it a class? I said, I'm a pastor up in North Phoenix. And he goes, really? He goes, I said, bud, we led three people to Christ tonight. He was so exhausted. He had a grin. He goes, oh, great news, great news. And we just kept walking. I said, I'm proud of you. You don't know me, but... He goes, ah, that's nice of you. Thanks. He goes, but it's not easy. And I'm like, well, I thought it was easy because I thought you were that kind. I just thought you were a nut. Goes, yeah, they all think I'm a nut. He goes, I just want to tell people about Jesus. We as college students left there. We did that for weeks, weeks on end. 
He always saw us. We'd give kind of a nod. That was all we really did. Didn't build relationship, just gave the nod. He'd give the nod, and he just did his thing. But it messed with my system. It, it messed with how am I supposed to be sharing Christ? We have a season ahead of us where we have on a platform, we have set for us a season that is dedicated to Jesus Christ's birth. I mean, there it is. And I'm like, how do I, use, how do I take advantage of that? I don't want to be the one to say, oh, I'm against this, and I can't believe they've taken Jesus out of this, and I can't believe they won't say, I'm not going there because they only say happy holidays. We're, we're not standing against things. We're standing for something. And when you and I are distracted by all that we're standing against, we're losing they can stand against anything they want, and many of them have a good heart about it. They're not trying to be jerks. They just don't think it's appropriate. That's okay. They're welcome to be wrong. But we're going to be about Christ. So there we would be <clears throat> standing against certain groups that aren't talking Jesus, or they won't mention Christmas because it's a holiday season now, and we're standing against all that, and another season goes, and none of us lead anybody to Christ. And I'm like, I think I know where the problem is. I think I just found the problem. The problem is not that they're not saying Merry Christmas. The problem is not that people are standing against Santa or that they're standing against a tree. They're, this isn't the problem. The problem isn't out there. The problem is in here. I don't know why we don't get more upset that more people aren't coming to know Christ. Change the color carpet. Now we'll get upset, right? It's church stuff. We changed this. We did this, which, by the way, here I am amazed over and over and over how non-traditional <clears throat> you guys really are. We'll change something. There'll be a comment, but the comment is more inquisitive The notes, it's not, I'll go ahead and say it. We, um, November 5th, um, the, the enthronement, the, in, right? The, uh, thanks. The, uh, the November 5th was supposed to have been communion because it's first Sunday of the month. I'll tell you, I don't know of a Baptist church. They usually do communion on the first Sunday of the month. That's kind of a standard thing uh, for Baptists. And if you skip it, I mean, you, there are going to be torches. That's, that is true on almost every Baptist church. And, and truthfully, I can expand that to churches overall. If you break that routine, you do communion every Sunday like the Christian church, and if you didn't one week, that pastor better not show up and park in the same parking spot the next day or have his wife start the car in the morning because you can't not do that. This church is very, very unique that way. Not one comment that we didn't do communion last November 5th. I'm, how many of you guys knew it, though? You realized it. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, I wish I was, should have. I love that. That's all fair game. Oh, you can ask. You can talk. We can, it just didn't to a schedule. Next week we're doing it a little different time in the service. How much kickback will we get? None. Because there's such a good spirit here for change because there's a larger focus. There's a bigger thing happening, and that is we are an organized local fellowship that exists to bring glory to God and to tell a lost world about Him. That's why we're here. I mean, that's it. 
So we disciple one another. We do. We want to grow, and that's all part of it, so that we don't disciple and grow just to disciple and grow. We disciple and grow so that we can see the compassion and love of Jesus permeate in this community and see people come to know Jesus. And whether it's Pentecostal, Lutheran, I I so don't care. I know what my theology is, and I'm going to hold to my theology. But there's a bigger piece at play. And I don't want to be the guy, I don't want to be the church, which you're not, to be known just to be standing against things. We'll stand against things. I'm not going to compromise. I don't want to be known for that. Be known as a church, oh, they're all about Jesus. They just love people too much. That's their problem. It'd be awesome. It'd be great. Get to heaven, and that's what God says. He goes, I got a problem with you. Oh, what is it? He goes, You just love too much. <laughs> He's not going to say it. So it starts with, God put the desire in me. I want to promote Jesus. That, uh, it's simple. I just want to promote Jesus. I want to talk about him. Would love to lead somebody to Christ. That's, that's it. And then watch him grow and lead someone else to Christ. There, there it is. We got it out there. That's what we want to do. That's what we support in our missions, people that are about that. Compassion, love, feed them. Salvation Army's got the greatest motto in the world. Any, anyone Salvation Army in the room? So, Soup Soap Salvation, that was their motto forever. Soup, soap, salvation. Give them something to eat, clean them up, tell them about Jesus. Right? Is that great? There was a painting in, uh, in the 1500s, and it's based on a passage in John 30. Uh, you could turn to the passage if you want, and I'll end with this. It's John 30. And let's see if the, um, the painting comes up okay. Yeah, that's good. It's kind of a, uh, well, it's kind of a famous, a famous painting. And the passage, uh, I'm having trouble finding it. John, no, no, it's John 3, because it's John the Baptist. It's John 3.30. Sorry about that. John the Baptist gaining a lot of attention. And in verse, let's go like 25, discussion arose, some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. I just love it, the detail they get into and miss the point. They came to John and said, Rabbi, Uh, He who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing, um, uh, and people are going to him. John says, a person cannot receive everyone unless he's given him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I've sent, I've been sent before him. Then down to the last part, verse 30, where he just comes, he must increase, I must decrease. So that painting is known for, his, for the elongated finger. That's what it's known for. It's in Germany. It's this, it's this awkward kind of, n- not, not me, it's him. Well, you've done good things. No, 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 no. It's him. Decrease me, increase him. It's what, exactly what he said. I must decrease, he increase. Are you the one? No, no, there's one coming great. It's him. It's over there. He's, it's, he's, he's him. And it's a very simple message for us in whether or not we're going to a Christmas party that is maybe as non-Christian as as you can get because it's a business. That's great. Enjoy. Have a great time. And as they're talking about things that they love, 
We talk about things that we love. As anyone compliments you, boy, you're really, how is that? Well, I go to church. No, don't give it to church. It's not I decrease, church increases. No, I come from a really good family. We have a good gene pool. A lot of gene pools need chlorine. Not my gene pool. My gene pool's really clean. No, I decrease he increases. We have four weeks ahead of us. That's it. We have four weeks, and then Christmas is going to be over. Another one down in the books. It's starting next week. Decorations are going up. If you can stick around today, they're going up right after church. Could use the help. We even give you pizza. It's going up today. And we have four weeks to figure out a way your personality, your associations, your contacts, your opportunities, it's all unique to you. How do you make Jesus the message? I'm going to suggest we start by praying and asking for the opportunity in the heart. That's that's the number one takeaway today. God, Will you put in me the desire to tell people? Then will you give me opportunity to say something? Because it's all starting this week. We have a great season ahead of us. We're in a really good place as a church. There's already a great spirit and attitude. There's already the belief in Jesus and the priority of Jesus. We have all of that. All we're asking, God, put now in me the stirred heart provoke my spirit to tell people about Jesus. you agree with me on that? To whatever degree, to whatever degree. It doesn't have to be a soapbox like this guy on Mill Avenue, although he's kind of my hero. Not a hero I want to be like, but my hero. It doesn't have to be that bold, but maybe step up. Let's pray. Would you in this one moment as we're thinking the most about this subject, would you ask God even right now for an increased stirred heart? Just ask Him and ask Him for opportunity. Enjoy the holiday. But be more aware Heavenly Father, we're asking, I think collectively and online, we're just asking, would you provoke our spirit, stir within us that people don't know you? We know people are responding. Give us opportunity, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.